I'm your Please honor. I to call Terence John O'Brien and Rodney Peter Spinks. Uh, Gentlemen, you both need to be sworn. Will you take an oath from the Bible? Would you both stand for me? There should be a Bible there. If you'd stand and take the Bible and repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. The evidence I shall give to this Royal Commission. The evidence I shall give to this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but, but the truth. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, uh, I'll start with you. Would you state your full names, your position in the organisation and your address? Yes, my name is Terence John O'Brien. My position with the organisation, as you mentioned, I'm a director of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Australia. Uh, I'm currently not serving as the coordinator of the branch committee in Australasia. I have an assignment in Papua New Guinea for 12 months, um, but I've kept up to date with the uh, information to do with the Royal Commission. That's why I've come back for the hearing. Um, so presently I reside in the branch facilities in Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea. Um, when, when did you um, cease having the responsibility of coordinator of the branch committee? Beginning in October 2016. And who is the current coordinator? Name is Winston Payne. Um, thank you. And uh, Mr Spinks, I'm coming to you. Would you state your full names, your position in the organisation? Rodney Peter Spinks. Uh, I'm the senior service desk elder in the service department. And I take it that you you based at um, the Jehovah's Witness Bethel in New South Wales? That's correct. And um, Mr O'Brien, that would be true of you as well. Oh, were you now in Papua New Guinea, sorry. Yeah. Yes, I'm here temporarily just for this two weeks, but otherwise in Papua New Guinea. Thank you. Um, Mr O'Brien, if I can refer you um, in the tender bundle to the document at tab one, it's a response uh, to the Royal Commission that's dated 3 January 2017, and uh, it's signed by you. Uh, are you familiar with that document? Yes. Um, and is it uh, true and correct? Yes. And then Mr O'Brien and Mr Spinks, I referred you to uh, your joint statement, which is uh, at tab 2, dated 24 February 2017. Mr O'Brien, to the best of your knowledge and ability, is it true and correct? Yes. Mr. Spinks? Yes. Um, Your Honour. Mr. Stewart, we might just mark the tender bundle. That was my proposal. 541. And now, Mr. O'Brien, I take it that following the hearing in case study 29, there was discussion at the branch committee level in relation to various sort of the points and issues that had arisen in the Royal Commission hearing, is that right? Yes. Can you explain what process uh, Watchtower Australia uh, went through in order to address the issues that had been raised? So, as a branch committee, we considered the various issues as they applied to us as a branch committee, what areas of responsibility we could um, implement any suggested changes. Um, as the, you would know, we had representatives from our World Headquarters legal department here at Case 29, um, and they returned with the um, case reports, and they've obviously looked at the reports in between. We've also since had members of our legal department here in Australia um, spend time at World Headquarters. So many of these issues have been discussed and that's where we are at present with them. And was there consultation between the branch committee and World Headquarters in relation to any of the issues? Yes. 
definitely. And in what way did that consultation take place? Well, first, as I mentioned, the two legal representatives who were here took back the information after conferring with uh, the branch committee before leaving. Then we had members of our legal department over there in consultation. And then in between, we've had, um, uh, prior to my going to Papua New Guinea, I was involved in some, but since then, to uh, quite a number of video conferences with personnel from World Headquarters Legal, our legal, our branch committee. And um, those discussions, I take it, were exploring uh, what between you regarded to be uh, necessary or advisable changes, would that be right? Yes, where we could improve in our policy and practices and procedures. That was the, the content of the discussions. I suppose you also identified what you regarded to be scriptural impediments to any changes. Yes, that was part of the subject of discussion, but the, the scriptural content of any change that would be referred back to um, a different committee of the governing body. That's not something the branch committee would review. Which committee of the governing body would that be? Well, probably the teaching committee of the governing body. And did the organisation in Australia take any external advice with regard to uh, what procedures uh, should be introduced or what changes should be made? We considered um, the many reference materials that were provided um, to and by the Royal Commission. Um, we reasoned that these are the ones with expertise that the Royal Commission has confidence in. So we've considered the various reports and um, case studies that were provided. And so if I'm to understand your answer correctly, you didn't take specific external expert advice with regard to changing your policies or procedures? Not outside of what was presented to the Royal Commission, no. Now, the upshot of that process you've described, as I understand it, uh, is that Initially, at least two new documents were produced, one a guide to service desks and one uh, a letter to elders. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. It's just as well <clears throat> to identify them because they um, become the critical documents. So if I can refer you to the document at tab 6. Well, actually, let's start at, if I may, at tab 7. I beg your pardon. screen in front of you, you can use either the yeah. screen or a physical uh, representation as, as you choose. Uh, now, that is a letter to all bodies of elders dated 1 August 2016. Uh, it's on the letterhead of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Australia. Now, first I take it, it was sent to all the bodies of elders uh, under the responsibility of the Australia branch, is that right? That's correct. And um, it's in identical or near identical form to a letter which was, to the best of your knowledge, sent to all bodies of elders around the world. Is that right? Yes, with obviously there would be some um, local adjustments depending on the um, legal aspects of different uh, branch territories. And so this letter was specifically um, authorised by the world headquarters, is that right? Yes. And then the other document uh, at tab 6 is the Child Protection Guidelines for Branch Office Service Desks, and it's referred to as the S66 document, is that right? That's correct. And that, as I understand it, was um, sent to uh, particular offices at service desks of branch offices around the world, is that right? As I understand, yes. Yes. So, if I understand this correctly, neither of these two documents go to ordinary congregates uh, of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Is that correct? No, they have a particular audience. So, the branch guidelines 
were prepared specifically to assist uh, service desks at branches in knowing how to respond to uh, elders who would call in for direction. The letter to the bodies of elders was provided for that audience, specifically for elders, so they would know what their <coughs> obligations were how to best handle any accusations of child abuse and a consequent um, shepherding, shepherding of the uh, victims. Now, I'll come in a moment to um, the document dated 7 March 2017, in other words, just a bit earlier this week. Um, but leaving that document, that very recent document, to one side, uh, is it the case then that insofar as the organisational response to allegations of child sexual abuse is concerned, ordinary congregants who are not elders and not deskmen, as they refer to as the service desk, uh, would have regard to the publication organised to do Jehovah's Will to find the organisational response? Yes, although that document, whilst these two documents are specifically dealing with child abuse matters, the Organised to Do Jehovah's Will is a publication um, that has very little to do with child sexual abuse. It's basically talking about the um, general um, min sorry, ministry of Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, I understand that. So still leaving aside the document of 7 March 2017, um, if a congregant wanted to know what processes there are uh, that the organisation follows in the event that an allegation of child sexual abuse uh, is raised, there's no specific policy document that they can have any access to, is that right? No, leaving aside that document which now corrects that. Yes. yes. And so to the extent that they could learn anything about, for example, the two witness rule or the judicial process within the organisation, they would be left with uh, organised to do Jehovah's Will? No, I think the average member of a congregation um, has exhaustive references to what we call the Watchtower Library and subjects such as those you've mentioned uh, considered in Watchtower articles that um, everyone has access to. And many of those going back over a long period of time. And, and recent, yes. So the most recent back to, I think, as far as 1930. So by the recent ones, are you referring to articles referenced um, by you in your response and in your joint statement that have been published since Case Study 29? Yes, so some, but then there are other Watchtower study articles that are reviewed at congregation meetings uh, which would contain... Um, other relevant information, but not specifically only dealing with um, the same as those reference materials, which are specific on child abuse. So an ordinary congregant would have to go doing their own research through those various publications you've mentioned to find the answer on any particular topic related to child sexual abuse, is that right? Yes, but the Watchtower Library is very much a user-friendly um, program which most of Jehovah's Witnesses have little trouble finding their way through. Well, I, I think you accepted on the previous occasion, uh, Mr O'Brien, that there was uh, an absolute need uh, in the organisation to bring these policies and procedures together in an easily accessible place for congregants. You we call that... Yes, which is what we've done. And, and that's what's led to the 7 March 2017 document, is that right? Yes, because yes. now it's specifically dealing with child abuse matters. Yes. So let's go to that then. I'm at tab 11. Um, there's a letter from the solicitors. Um, perhaps there isn't. Uh, in any event, that's... That's the first document at tab 11 um, is a solicitor's letter dated 8 March 2017, um, which in the main paragraph um, says that we've been working on developing a policy statement of Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia in relation to child protection 
as the final draft has only just been completed for distribution to congregations, we are pleased to provide a copy of the Child Safeguarding Policy of Jehovah's Witnesses um, in Australia. And then that's the, the document that follows. Now, firstly, in relation to this document, um, has it yet been published or made available to uh, congregants generally in Australia? No, it's dated for release in March. It had been planned some time with the wanting to get it to the Royal Commission before this. I feel this is the final version. It has been approved now by the branch committee. It is an Australia document. It's not a worldwide document, so we've been able to give approval for that now. Um, so we anticipate in the next week or so it will now be made available to congregations throughout Australia. And you, when you say you got approval for it, that's from the World Headquarters or, or the governing body, is that right? Yeah, a, a draft was obviously sent to the um, Coordinators Committee who look after legal matters for the worldwide field. Um, but the uh, Australia document here gained final approval by the branch committee for release. When was it adopted by the branch committee? Uh, just this last week we've done, given the final version, that, the one that you have here. Do you mean this week or do you mean last week? No, this week we finally finalised the final edits on it, just a, so were, a few were, minor edits. Was there a meeting of the branch committee this week that approved and adopted this version? I think the meeting was held previously. We would have just circulated it for final review, but it was only had a couple of minor edits to make on it. And when did work on this document commence? Well, I'm not sure on that. That's happened since my transfer to Papua New Guinea, but I think Mr Spinks has been involved in that, and he could give you a much better answer to the Mr. question. Spinks? So, immediately following the uh, public hearing in Case Study 29, uh, we went away with a clear picture, as did the representatives from uh, headquarters here, that we needed to make some adjustments with documentation, which we incrementally uh, did. Uh, so there's been a lot of discussion about this. It's actually based on a policy that was under development and uh, issued for the UK, but obviously there are some different um, implications there. So uh, it's been a drawn-out pro process, and towards the end we we wanted to have it available for the Royal Commission. When our hearing date got brought forward, um, we have had to move quickly. We didn't send it to the congregations this week for the obvious reason that if there's a suggestion or discussion, we just wanted to reserve the right to uh, make any minor adjustments before it's distributed. But we actually... It's taken some time, but we've actually brought it forward a little bit so we could present it to the... Uh, Royal Commission. And how long ago, Mr Spinks, was it in a form uh, similar to the one that we see now? In other words, leaving minor changes aside. I'm not certain with regard to the UK, um, but I would think over the last three or four months there's been discussion and video conferences and that to get it into the shape that's, uh, that it's in. We wanted some specific inclusions, um, which we're glad have uh, been included. We've referred to it as a uh, as a living document that we we want to make whatever adjustments need to be made to it, further adjustments if necessary, um, so that it's applicable for Australia. Um, back um, to you, Mr. O'Brien. Um, is there any plan, to your knowledge, to revise? Uh, organised to do Jehovah's Will, at least in relation to uh, policies and procedures responding I'm to child sexual abuse? I'm unaware of any plans in that line. Now, in relation to um, uh, S66, so that's the guideline to service desks, um, I'd like to refer you to tab 21.
Um, now, this, if I understand how to read it correctly, in the um, starting to read it one third of the way down the page, where um, the world headquarters um, heading appears, um, there's a letter from world headquarters to um, branch committees of all branches. Um, is that right? That's correct. And then above that, um, there are, are two other um, entries. Um, can you just explain what those are and the time sequence in which um, they occur? Yes, that's a standard way we respond. So the initial letter that you referred to there from World Headquarters to all branches uh, is the first mailing. Then if there's a brief response, not requiring a, a second a letter as a response, then the uh, letter note we refer to that as above is provided. And then if there's another brief response, which is the top one, is another response to that. Right, so one reads these in reverse order, like email um, chains, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And now in the letter itself, and the second bullet point you'll see, it says that um, the letter of 1 August 2016, so that's the document we looked at earlier at tab uh, 6, uh, or 7 rather, will replace the letter dated October 1, 2012 to all bodies of elders. Um, so I take it that's right, it replaces that earlier letter. That's correct, yes. Yeah. So as of the date of the 1 August 2016 letter, the 1 October 2012 letter no longer applies. That's true. Right. And in the main paragraph um, in that letter, I don't intend reading it, but you'll see that much emphasis is placed on the confidentiality of the S66 document, and it says as to who specifically it can be given to, um, including that it's not to be given to uh, service desk secretaries. Now, can you just explain what is the... I, I know this instruction didn't come from you, it came from World Headquarters, but I'm hoping you can assist us. What's the secrecy or confidentiality concern with regard to this guide to service desks? Once again, I could defer to Mr Spinks, who will give you more accurate yes, he, answer than what I'd be able he to. He works in the service, mm -hmm. the service desk. Yes, Mr Spinks. Uh, again, I, I probably can't answer for the reason that it was um, written there, but um, I, I guess those of us on service desks have been given a heavy responsibility as we see it to ensure that we meld together the um, August 1 letter and the service desk uh, guidelines. It's a responsibility we take very seriously in giving advice out. So my reading of it was simply that it's the responsibility of the service desk to make application uh, of it and has ownership of the document. Beyond that, I, I couldn't uh, comment. Do you appreciate that someone from outside the organisation might struggle to understand why there should be such secrecy with regard to something which is a procedural document as to how matters should be handled procedurally. Do you see that? I recognise that, and this came up in the earlier public hearing, that there's no doubt that uh, some of our correspondence, it's well understood by the audience it's intended for, um, but read from a, a critical perspective, and we appreciate that, um, that it could be seen that way. Uh, our understanding of it or our application of it is the elders have a letter that applies to their function and role. Uh, the service desks have a, uh, guidelines that are specific to their function and role. And there's some reasonable amount of uh, discretion required in the application of that on a case-by-case on -case basis, but I take your point. See, it, it might leave someone with the impression that uh, there's really a, a dual practice here, that congregants are being kept from information which, with regard to processes that govern their, govern their lives or govern issues that arise in their lives. Do you see that? Uh, I understand that criticism that has been made. From our perspective, uh, it's audience-specific. Uh, the instructions are there, uh, there for a service desk to make application of it. Again, I take your point. Now, Mr Sphinx, while, while um, we're with you, you 
may wish to answer this question, although, Mr. O'Brien, if you have something you wish to say about it, by all means, um, do so. Now, you say, both of you in your, in your statement, that the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that child sexual abuse is an abhorrent sin. That's right, isn't it? That's correct. Right. And um, it's that teaching of the Jehovah's Witnesses that you rely on as an important element of your strategy to make the organization a child-safe organization, is that right? That and making sure that we conform with whatever uh, legal requirements there are. We've, we've taken the recommendations of the Royal Commission seriously. Yes, Mr Sphinx, I said it's an important element. And what I'm saying is one of the... One of the things you say with regard to what you do to make your organization child safe is that you teach Jehovah's Witnesses that child sexual abuse is an abhorrent sin. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. And, um, of course, just what child sexual abuse is in the eyes um, and in the teaching of the organization is therefore important. Do you accept that? Uh, yes. And to the Royal Commission, um, child sexual abuse includes uh, sexual or sexualized activity by an adult with anyone under the age of consent. Um, do you accept that? Yes. Now, I'd like to refer you to the letter to elders at tab 7 um, and seek your clarification with regard to something. In particular... If on page two you would look at paragraph ten, which is headed Congregation Considerations, um, and you'll see some distinctions are drawn. Um, and in particular, the sentence I want to ask you about is the last sentence, but by all means read the whole lot. And the last, last sentence is, rather, this is in relation to what is child sexual abuse, we are referring to an adult guilty of sexually abusing a minor who is a young child. I don't think there's any question about that. And it goes on, or an adult guilty of sexual involvement with a minor who is approaching adulthood but was not a willing participant. Now, the, the um, question there is really this. This seems to be saying that within the eyes of the organisation and teaching of the organisation, a minor consenting to sexual involvement with um, an adult, it's, um, sorry, a more mature minor, or as it's put just, um, a minor who is approaching adulthood, um, is not regarded as child sexual abuse. No, that's not correct. That's not the intent of that, and if I could briefly explain. Yes, so what I'm getting at is to understand the organisation's teaching or understanding as to where the line is drawn uh, with regard to looking at the question of, of age or majority, where the line is drawn with regard to what is child sexual abuse. I think if you go back to earlier in the paragraph, if I could, to, to give that context... Yeah. Uh, and remembering that this is in addition to whatever legal implication, this is a, a congregation consideration. It says, when discussing child sexual abuse from a congregation standpoint, uh, we're not discussing a situation in which a minor who is a willing participant and who is approaching adulthood is involved in sexual activity with an adult who is a few years older than the minor. So uh, while that's a broad expression, our experience has been, for example, where we have seen it as child sexual abuse. One of the um, uh, reports that we provided to the Royal Commission where we viewed it that way, the elders have reported it that way, but the authorities don't necessarily um, view it that way, where the age gap is close. So that's not to be interpreted to say if the minor is willing there are situations where, for example, a 19-year-old and a 16-year-old may have a consensual relationship. Now, there may be an implication under law. There may not. The same with the congregation. Were, this, were these close ages and consensual, 
or was the age gap such that there's either a legal implication or a congregation implication? So basically you're saying is that final sentence must be read as qualified by the first sentence. It's talking about uh, two people relatively close in age. Correct. Right. What, what, and, what is understood by a participant who is approaching adulthood? What does that mean? For example, Your Honour, um, there may be a 16-year-old whose age of consent, and we're not, while we promote high moral standards, we're not so naive as to think that 16 and 18-year-olds aren't having sex. So we appreciate that um, there are circumstances where you've got two consenting people. One is technically by law an adult, one is approaching adulthood. Um, so it's in that context. Well, that... Again, ask you, what what do you understand to be someone approaching adulthood? Uh, so the, that was the example I used, Your Honour, where... 16-year-old. Well, not necessarily. Well, the that's other... what I'm trying to find out. Well, I think the law, uh, the law is probably um, clear to us on that. For example, a 16-year-old may be able to consent. Um, and, and so, again, if it was a 16 and an 18-year-old, we are not talking about here young teenagers with adults. We're talking about where there's a similar age. I understand what you're talking about. I'm still trying to find out what you understand to be a participant approaching adulthood. Uh, it would always be someone of a close age to 18, uh, Your Honour. That's our understanding. You know, that's, that's, that's how we view it, taking into account the whatever legal implications there are too. So it wouldn't include a 16-year-old in your understanding? Uh, I did mention the example that the law would permit a 16-year-old in some states to have sex with an 18-year-old. Um, we're not going to necessarily view it differently if, they're of a, a, um, if, if it's a consensual relationship between a 16-year-old and an 18-year-old. Well, let's test it further. What about a 15-year-old? I think in most cases the, the law would have an implication there as well that we would take into account. And, um, each situation, we would get legal advice but also make a determination, is this two young people of a similar age that have a consensual relationship or is one using his, for example, authority or older age to take advantage of the younger person? Well, the difficulty, Mr. Sphinx, that you face, isn't it, is that <clears throat> according to your teachings, the Bible doesn't specify an age as to when one reaches adulthood. Oh, that's correct. And I suppose in ancient times, um, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, um, it may have been at the time that the um, scriptures were written that uh, s someone in modern times would be regarded as very young, like a 13, 14-year-old might be able to marry. Would that be right? Oh, it's certainly not in the Bible. Thank, thank you for... I appreciate that as a case in some cultures, but the Bible teaches very clearly that it would be someone who's past youth. But but your point is taken that there's no strict rule in the in the Scriptures. Well, the, but that leaves us with the question of when is past youth? I, I probably am not understanding your question. Well, I don't want to be evasive because, uh, again... We've had, and I'd be very happy to provide the details of this to the Commission, we've had situations recently because of our heightened sense of awareness of these issues where the elders have taken a young couple, one recently in Victoria where the girl was 15 and the young man was in his early 20s. They're from a, a culture outside Australia, courting young. We, they were obligated under law to go to the police uh, the elders went with the family to interpret and, and the police said in that instance that they didn't view it as a, a sexual assault um, of, uh, of the minor. So there, there are complications from a congregation point of view. We probably have a stricter view than the law. Mr Spinks, I don't want to spend time on it. The simple point is this, is the law, perhaps for reasons of pragmatism as much as anything else, and uh, draws clear lines between uh, when one can consent and when one can't consent um, legally um, to sexual intercourse, whereas the Jehovah's Witnesses don't. And would it not make your approach to things a lot easier and a lot clearer if you just followed the clear lines of the law uh, in uh, relation to this? 
that's a complete misunderstanding, and I apologise, Mr Stewart. This is a secondary consideration to the law. Jehovah's Witnesses will always abide by the law. So this expression uh, relates to where the law doesn't have an implication. The congregation may still view it as uh, child sexual abuse or not, but it's always secondary to the law. So I can't see a situation where that would occur. Uh, in, as you'll be aware, uh, Mr Ryan, coming back to you, in case study 29, <clears throat> uh, the Royal Commission found that it's a general practice of the Jehovah's Witness organisation in Australia not to report allegations of child sexual abuse to the police or other authorities unless required by law to do so. You're aware of that finding, of course? I'm aware of the finding, but we have never had a practice of not reporting. Well, Mr. Brown, we went through this on a previous occasion, so I don't want to spend time on it, but of the 1,006 cases, if I recall correctly, not one was reported by the Jehovah's Witnesses organisation. Well, I think the point was brought out that hundreds were reported, not by the organisation, because the organisation doesn't report. That's left to the elders handling the case. They're the ones who take the matter to the authorities or encourage the parents. The simple to point is this, is, is it's your policy is to not report um, unless the law requires it. That's the policy, simply put, isn't it? No, that's not the policy. If I could correct you again, yes. you excuse me for doing that. Our, our policy is if it's mandatory reporting, we report. If the child or other children are at risk because of the perpetrator, we will report. And thirdly, we will always inform the parents, or if it's an adult survivor, that they have the absolute right to report. So to suggest we have a policy of not reporting is quite inaccurate. Well, you've qualified it in one respect then. You said you have a policy to not report unless you assess that a child is at risk of harm. So we referring to the elders in the congregation, not the organisation, and keeping in mind that even if it is, there is no risk and it's not mandatory reporting, we still inform the parent or the survivor, if it's an adult, they have the absolute right to report and we will support them if they do that. Yes, but that's, a, that's then a case of them reporting, not, not the elders or the organisation reporting, not so. No, because so, the law allows... In relation to reporting where there's an assessment of harm, can you identify, just for ease of reference, where in the uh, three documents uh, that's reflected? Yeah, again, if I could refer that yes, to Mr Spanks, he's more expertise on that. Sure. Um, if I push just momentarily... We mentioned previously that it has been our practice at the branch office to inform the elders on every occasion that if there's a risk um, to a child or uh, other children, that the matter is to be uh, reported to the police. And we've documented that policy um, in the uh, child safeguarding, safeguarding policy of Jehovah's Witnesses uh, in Australia. But it's also been documented by uh, the legal department and by the service department in each case where we get a report that the elders and subsequently the parents are informed of that. And uh, yes, I understand, Mr. Spinks. I'm just asking you to assist to identify where in these documents that guide the service desk, that guide the elders, and that guide the congregation. Those are the three documents we are looking at. Sure. Where that's recorded. So, firstly, if I could. If I could, uh, if you just give me a moment, thank you. Policy six. Yep. <coughs> so, in the uh, child safeguarding policy, dated March 7. Yes. So, that's the one at tab 11, yes. Point number nine, it 
says if congregation elders learn of a case of child abuse in which a child may still be at risk of harm, they will ensure that a report to the police or other appropriate authorities is made immediately. Right. Thank you. Yes. And in the other documents? Uh, so, obviously, in the publications, which were tendered at the previous public hearing, our, our um, publications have been saying that for decades, that if a child's at risk, um, whatever the cost, that's the procedure that we followed. It's documented in the reports that the service department receives. It's documented in the legal department's um, documents, but we recognise that it needed to be also put into this safeguarding policy. When the document says the elders learn of a case of child abuse, <laughs> are we to understand that as learn of an allegation? Correct. Why doesn't, it, why doesn't it say that? I think it's a good suggestion. It's a poor, poor choice of words, but that's, that's the reference as, uh, is of an allegation. Um, you see eight speaks and seven speak in terms of allegation. There was yes. no intention to have a different meaning, was there? Uh, again, the practice is clear, uh, Your Honour, and I think that's testified to by the fact that in each case over recent years, uh, as we've documented, the policy is significantly or practice is significantly different to 30 years ago, but certainly each of the cases, for example, in the period prior to and subsequent to the public hearing, um, that's been documented in every every instance. And tell me this: if um, you receive an allegation of abuse and you initiate your processes, um, but you don't get a confession, but you get a very clear statement from the victim that you would rationally believe, but for the fact that you don't have a confession or two witnesses. Um, I appreciate that you would tell the adult victim they can go to the police. But with the knowledge that you would have in that circumstance, do you have any understanding of the law that might require you to report to the police? You mentioned there, if I could, you want a, an adult survivor? Yeah. Uh, yes, and our, in every instance, uh, and there was discussion, Your Honour, as you recall, in relation to 316 in New South mm -hmm. Wales, and which has um, been extensively um, considered. So in, in each allegation, the responsibility of our legal department, regardless of whether it's a child or an adult, is to determine firstly, um, is there a, a, a reporting requirement under law? And obviously that then supersedes any other consideration. So in the circumstance I put to you, um, you would tell the police? Uh, you mentioned an adult survivor, so I just yeah. may be confused. Yeah, an adult survivor. Uh, who, who comes to you and says, I've been abused, and it's pretty clear, but for the fact that you don't have a second witness, that um, this person's telling you the truth. Your Honour, um, at the commission, in the publications, Your Honour himself has said that some individuals, adults, choose not to report and recognise that... No, 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 no. I, I must what be... obligation do you think you have under law? In that circumstance. With an adult survivor yeah. <coughs> to comply with whatever mandatory reporting requirement there is, Your Honour, whether that be a, a specific mandatory re reporting requirement or a 316 or similar, we're absolutely obligated to comply with that. And you would comply with it? Absolutely. Well, I'll come to the legal guidelines <coughs> um, uh, shortly. But just getting back to this point, so you've identified in paragraph 9 of this um, 7 March document, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that, isn't it, and well, I'm, just, I'm asking the question so you can show me if I've misread it or overlooked it. The other two documents, the one that guides service desks 
and the one that guides elders don't uh, have any statement to this effect. In other words, that a report should be made to the authorities if a child is considered to be at harm or at risk. That's not cle as clearly stated in those. It's not clearly stated in those documents. It's a valid point, uh, and our reason for wanting it included in this one, and in fact, uh, just in the last two weeks in a video conference, uh, I raised the very same issue. You know, why have we all agreed to put it in the, the public document, which is great, but we need to retrospectively use the same expression in those uh, two letters, and that, that absolutely has to happen. Well, it's more than just a valid point. I mean, it's a very critical point, isn't it, that the policy uh, which guides the service desk and the elders in the organisation in Australia is to not report to the authorities uh, unless required to do so. I accept the caveat to encourage people to report or tell them they have a right to report themselves. I accept that caveat. But it's actually not a caveat that applies to the other one that Mr O'Brien added, which was also if the child is at risk of harm. Uh, that's incorrect. It's correct that it's not in the document. But the evidence, and we're happy to make that available to you, Mr Stewart, the evidence shows that our practice has been well, to make that um, assessment in every situation. Well, that, may, that may be the practice. My point is in relation to the policy, and it's not stated, and you would agree it should be uh, revisited and addressed. I've already raised it myself. I absolutely agree. And, uh, in fact, the Royal Commission recommended, as you'll be aware, that the organisation should always report allegations of child sexual abuse to authorities where the complainant is still a minor at the time that the abuse comes to the attention of the organisation or where there are others who may still be at risk at the hands of the alleged abuser. Now, you haven't adopted that recommendation. Can you explain why? Uh, we have, uh, with respect, Mr Stewart, again, if it's documentation... That may be the case, but you're aware that each of the inc incidents that have been reported to us, whatever the seriousness of it, uh, since the public hearing, have been reported to the police for the very reason that you raise. Well, Mr Spinks, the best evidence of what the policies are of the organisation is to look at the policy documents. And if it's not there, then it's not the policy. Wouldn't that be right? Uh, with regard to documentation, that's correct. But with, with respect, Mr Stewart, if you looked at the incidents that have been reported to Jehovah's Witnesses since the public hearing, each of those has been reported to the police. So uh, with respect, the documentation part of it I totally agree with and have made that recommendation myself. And uh, Mr Spinks, while the documents now make it clear that uh, survivors or their parents um, should be told that they have, as it's put, an absolute right to report. Um, it's not the policy to actually encourage them to report, is it? I think that's, again, not correct, because as the uh, reports on each matter uh, that's been reported to us since the public hearing, both the legal department and the service department uh, use the same expression that it is their absolute right to report and the elders will fully support you in doing Mr. that. Mr Abra, I think the point that's being made is that uh, it's one thing to have responded since we looked at you, mm -hmm. another thing as to what you'll be doing in five years' time. You understand? Yeah, five, unless, five years' unless future, unless Your Honour? intent is reflected clearly in your policy documents, there's a very good chance you'll just fall backwards. Do you understand? Uh, the point is well taken, Your Honour. We've put it in the, the most recent document and retrospectively it has to be adjusted in the other documents. I take that point. Now, we discussed a moment ago your reporting obligations even in relation to an adult victim. That's not referred to in this document either, is it? Uh, that... Uh, would be a matter for the legal department, um, Your Honour, because every 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 state well, it might is. Might be, but, but surely it's a matter for the policy document, isn't it? If that's the policy, could the I, could I ask, that's where you should. Find could it. I ask you to repeat the specific point, Your Honour? Yeah. The, the obligation to report where the law requires uh, knowledge of an adult victim 
is not referred to in here. With respect, Your Honour, the, the most recent document says in paragraph five, it says... Right, when you say the most recent document, I'm, so still looking, I'm still looking at... The child safeguarding policy, yeah. Yeah, paragraph five, yeah. says that the elders will consult with the Australasia branch office of Jehovah's Witnesses and will comply with any relevant secular reporting laws. So the other documents... So that's where it's to be found, isn't it? Um, if you just give me a moment, uh, you're right. August 1, uh, 2016, letter protecting minors from abuse, the letter to elders. Tab 7. Yeah. Paragraph 5 says uh, legal considerations uh, in some jurisdictions, uh, individuals who learn of an allegation of child abuse may be obligated by law to report the allegation to the secular authorities. And then paragraph seven says the legal department will provide legal advice based on the facts and the applicable law. So in, in every case that um, is, is considered. I'll leave Mr Stewart to explore what that actually means. Um, well, the, the lens through which one might explore that is to look at what the legal department guidelines say. Um, because the position now, just to recap, is uh, when elders learn of an allegation of child sexual abuse, they to immediately phone the legal department, is that right? That's correct. And the legal department will give advice on their legal uh, obligations? That's correct. And then pass it on to the service department? Yes. They also have some advice that they give in addition to the law, but in principle, that's correct. Right. And the we called for and we've been furnished with uh, the guidelines that the legal department uses in, in fielding those calls. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. And so if we look at the one for New South Wales, for example, at tab 13, and perhaps before we even look at it, we can address some, some bigger pictures. I mean, there, there are differences in the legal requirements across the states and territories, is that right? Correct. And it's a complex environment? Very much so. Would the Jehovah's Witnesses um, support uh, national uniformity to the extent that that can be achieved? Absolutely. Yes. Um, now, if one has a look at, at uh, this um, guideline, uh, which is headed reporting obligations in New South Wales, and then there's, there are a number of standard points set out under the heading taking calls concerning abuse matters. Do you see that? Yes. And as I understand it, those are um, general points set to apply across the states and territories, and then the more specific um, provisions are dealt with uh, on the next page. Would that be right? That appears to be correct, yes. And in uh, paragraph 7, it says, if the victim is still a child under 16, is he or she still in danger? In other words, this is a question that must be asked. If so, the service de department will provide necessary direction to ensure um, the child's protection. Now, um, you see that it doesn't ask whether there's another child in danger. I think, again, these are... Notes. I'm not in the legal department. These are the notes of the legal department. But uh, I think the safeguarding policy uses the generic um, child. But I agree again. That should say if a child is uh, or any child is still in danger. That's a good point. And re related to that is even if uh, the victim at the time that the call is taken is an adult, uh, it doesn't deal with the question of what to do if other children are still at home. So in other words, a 20-something, 30-something-year-old um, reports abuse by 
someone who stood in the congregation, the particular person's abuse occurred many, many years before, but that, that there are other children potentially at harm um, because of that abuser still being there. This doesn't deal with that. Um, you'd have to excuse my ignorance, I'm not a lawyer, Mr Stewart, but does the act that supports this advice make that point? Well, I'm not certain. This is only the legal advice is the point I'm making. You, you, you're effectively making the point, which is this, is why do you legalise it all the time and rely always on what the law provides? Why do you as an organisation just not adopt the policy, as many other organisations do, of reporting as a matter of course if there are still children who might be in harm's way? Uh, again, with respect, Mr Stewart, that's a very isolated point. This is the specific legal advice that is given. When the call comes through to the service department, uh, in every situation, that is the advice that's given. This, this is purely the legal requirement. So why do we legalise the matter? Because they're getting legal advice when it comes through to the service department. Uh, then we uh, assess this. Well, this is, the trouble is you've taken us straight back to where we were. We were talking about the service department guidelines a minute ago, which doesn't have the kind of policy recorded that I'm speaking of, which is uh, uniform reporting where there's any risk of harm. And you referred us to the legal obligations. Uh, now we're on the legal obligations. You're referring us back to the service I think that's... Uh, that's I respect that's how you're viewing it. If, if you want, could I clarify it again? Is that well, let me put the question again. Sure. Why is it that the Jehovah's Witness uh, organisation has not adopted a standard policy to report allegations of child sexual abuse to the authorities where there is still or an ongoing risk of harm to any child? Uh, we do, uh, Mr Stewart. If it needs to be better documented, this is simply an extract of the applicable legal advice. This has nothing to do with our spiritual uh, process, our scriptural process in the, in the service department. Mr Spinks, when you say we do, what you mean to say is we do, as a matter of practice, report where a child might still be at risk. Is that what you mean to say? Correct. Yes, and I'm addressing this at the level of policy. Why do you not adopt it clearly in your policy that guides your service desk to report in all cases of allegations of child sexual abuse where uh, there's a risk of a child still being at home. Again, we do, Mr Stewart, and we will put that in that document, and that has been the practice. Uh, it is the policy. We've put it in the most recent policy document, and it has to be added into the others. Now, uh, this legal landscape, and I understand that from I'm not mistaken that n neither of you are lawyers, but the legal landscape is complex. You've, you've agreed and accepted that. And there are distinctions between different types of reporting. There may be reporting where there's a risk of significant harm, perhaps to the child protection authorities. There may be reportable conduct schemes, for example, to the ombudsman uh, overseeing how organisations are themselves dealing with reports that are made. And there are also, like Section 316 of the Crimes Act in New South Wales, concealment offences where um, a serious offence um, has been committed or there's knowledge with regard to the commission of a serious offence and it's then an offence not to report that. So there are these different um, regimes. Has the Jehovah's Witness organisation in Australia uh, taken a view as to what the best way of dealing with these matters in the law is? so that you are able to make submissions or recommendations to the Royal Commission as to what the commissions should be saying about these matters? I think all along we have said that we would totally support a simplified mandatory reporting scheme that is uncomplicated for uh, all organisations. We've uh, repeatedly said that, um, and that, that is still, still our position. And, and beyond that, you haven't looked at these different possibilities of, uh, that I've mentioned to you. Mentioned uh, to you. I, I think we've made the point, if I could repeat what Mr O'Brien said earlier, we comply with mandatory 
reporting requirements, uh, whether that's a specific one or there's an implication under law. I believe the folder that we provided for the tender bundle, we've simply got the summation sheets here, but the legal department obviously has the various acts and laws which have um, understandably not included. But we completely comply with mandatory reporting. We will report if there's a child or children at risk, and in the absence of that, anyone has the right to... I'm sorry, report. you're misunderstanding me. I'm only asking you as to what assistance you can give to the commissioners as to... In, in their deliberations, in making recommendations as to what the law should be, and am I to understand you correctly beyond saying it should be national, uniform, and simple? Uh, you don't have anything more to say on that. Uh, I should come back to my first and most accurate statement. That was I'm not a lawyer, but we would love to have our uh, legal department, who would be better qualified to do that, to provide um, our observations if that's the wish of the commission. Uh, just in relation to the specific legal advice, um, there, there are various errors that, are, that occur in these documents. I'll just take you to two um, to demonstrate them and, and then leave you with, um, uh, hopefully you'll agree um, with an acceptance that they need to be looked at again. Um, if we go to tab uh, 14, which is headed reporting obligations in Queensland. <coughs> and you'll see that it says the age of consent is 16 for heterosexuals and 18 for homosexuals. Do you see that? Yes. Um, now, firstly, are you aware that the law in Queensland in relation to um, age of consent changed last year? I'm not. If, if this is inaccurate, then that needs to be addressed, but I, I wasn't aware of that. Well, it's inaccurate in that respect. It's inaccurate in another, and, that, and that's that it's 16. Um, there's no longer a distinction, and it's inaccurate in another respect, and that is that uh, the law draws no distinction um, or drew no distinction prior to change and subsequently between um, heterosexuals and homosexuals. In other words, the age of consent um, at 18 was set for... Um, anal intercourse um, man or a woman. You're not aware of that? No, obviously. I see there's a reference there, uh, Mr Stewart. The, the criminal code is not attached, but I wouldn't be able to interpret it anyway. But if that's incorrect, then I'm happy to report that back and have that adjusted. Um, right. Going on now to address the two witness rule. Um, Mr O'Brien, you're aware, of course, that the Royal Commission found that the application of the two-witness rule in cases involving child, child sexual abuse is wrong. You, you're aware of that finding? Yes, I'm aware of the finding. And the recommendation that the Jehovah's Witness Organisation should revise and modify its application of the two-witness rule, at least in cases involving complaints of child sexual abuse. You're aware of that recommendation? Yes, I'm aware. And I take it that that finding and that recommendation were the subject of the discussions you referred to earlier in the organisation with regard to its response to the Royal Commission? Yes, so we considered uh, the implications of that finding. And um, your response is to say that the two witness rule is required by the scriptures and can't be changed or avoided, is that correct? That's correct, that's our stand. And. Uh, Your Honour, I'm not sure what Your Honour's intention was. How much longer would you make? Uh, well, I'll take us till one o'clock, Your Honour. Um, well, we'd better take the morning adjournment then. We'll take that adjournment now. All stand.